Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, now time for the formal element of our proceedings. But before I proceed to introduce the minister, could I uh, thank uh, Abner Klein, the CEO of uh, Point Trading, a very successful Australian company, a very innovative Australian company of 26 years' presence on their sponsorship uh, today. Aspie is very pleased by the association. Abner, thank you uh, very much again for your support today. Uh, I'm privileged to be able to say that uh, Stephen Smith's been a friend of mine for the past uh, 30 years. He's a barrister by profession, took him to uh, London, then back to Perth into the office of Attorney General Berenson of the day. Uh, promotion, if that's the appropriate word, to the role of ALP General Secretary in, uh, in Western Australia, where he developed a formidable reputation as a campaigner, which then took him on to Prime Minister Keating's office and into the House of Representatives in 1993, where of times of the Rudd and Gillard Labor governments, he's given outstanding service in the portfolios of foreign affairs and defence. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming the Defence Minister, Stephen Smith. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for that uh, kind uh, introduction. And before I come to uh, my remarks uh, for, for and to Aspie, can I just take this opportunity uh, first up of joining with the Prime Minister in condemning the terrible and tragic events in Boston, uh, join with the uh, international community in condemning the atrocity, pleased to repeat that which the Foreign Minister and the uh, Prime Minister have said, that uh, at this stage we have no indication and no advice that any Australians have been caught up in this terrible event. Uh, you'll also be pleased to know the Chief and I, Chief of the Defence Force, General Hurley and I spoke about this uh, before lunch. Uh, we have accounted for all of our Australian Defence Force personnel who are stationed or posted uh, in the United States uh, and we are working with DFAT to ensure that any of our personnel who may, for example, be in the United States on leave or the like are accounted for. But so far as anyone uh, posted in the United States or family members uh, they are accounted for and, uh, and safe, uh, but we should uh, reflect upon those uh, terrible and tragic events of the day. Well, firstly, can I thank uh, Stephen, can I thank Aspie for uh, the invitation to again speak to you? Uh, can I thank uh, Avner Klein and uh, Point Trading for sponsoring uh, the event? Can I acknowledge uh, the Chief of the Defence Force and the Secretary of the Department of Defence? Can I also acknowledge members of the Diplomatic Corps? Uh, and in addition to acknowledging uh, Stephen Loosley, who is of course the chairman of uh, ASPE and a former senator, can I also acknowledge my former parliamentary colleague Laurie Brereton, who takes a keen interest in strategic and defence matters these days. Um, I said to Stephen uh, over lunch that in my first term, 93 to 96, the last term of the Hawke Keating government. Uh, I was down here with some colleagues on a Wednesday night. Wednesday, of course, is a parliamentary dining night because the House gets up at, at, uh, at eight. We were having uh, dinner here and at a, a table at the other end of the restaurant was Gareth Evans, who was then, of course, Foreign Minister at a table. And Gareth uh, walked out and as he walked out at the end of his dinner, he came over to our table and he said, well, good to see you here, etc. And one of us said, Gareth, we should get together on a Wednesday night. We should have dinner. To which Gareth said, that's a very good idea. Should I do a paper in advance of... <laughs> we said, no, no, something informal will, 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 will be fine. But because it's this restaurant and because it's Aspie, I have prepared a paper. Uh, and uh, I will... Uh, some of you know that uh, more often than not I'll go off the cuff. But today, given... Uh, the importance of ASPE and the role that it plays in informing public debate and encouraging discussion, uh, and given the importance, uh, in my view, of the subject matter, I'll, uh, I'll go uh, uh, with my prepared text. Um, and uh, if I go on too long, I'll either chipmunk a bit or I'll let a bit out, but the paper will be there for all to, uh, to see. One of the most important national security issues facing Australia in the immediate period is transition in and out drawdown from Afghanistan. This follows transition and drawdown in Timor-Leste, which was completed nearly three weeks ago. This year will also see transition and drawdown by the Australian Defence Force, the ADF, in the Solomon Islands, leaving a police law enforcement presence only. These changes 
particularly the drawdown from our major overseas operation in Afghanistan, will help shape future Australian overseas policy and the posture of the ADF in the years to come. The 2013 White Paper, to be published by the end of June, was brought forward by the Government in part to deal with this strategic challenge, namely the strategic and practical implications of the ADF's operational drawdown from Afghanistan, Timor-Leste and the Solomon Islands. This includes the implications for both Australia's strategic environment and posture and for the ADF itself. This consideration will ensure that the mistakes following our last such major transition and drawdown, Vietnam, will not be repeated. These mistakes followed on from a transition and a drawdown from Vietnam not marked by the same detailed international community planning as has occurred on Afghanistan from the Lisbon summit on, but rather epitomised by the image of helicopters leaving the United States Embassy roof, again underlining the old adage that people may not remember how you arrive, but they certainly remember how you leave. As a consequence, reputational damage is always a risk in any transition, drawdown or withdrawal process. Australia has enhanced its reputation as a, result, as a result of its commitment in Afghanistan, and it is important that this be maintained to the end of 2014. The mistakes of the post-Vietnam era saw shortfalls in strategic planning about the adverse impact the withdrawal from Vietnam would have on the ADF. A reduction in military numbers and the shunning of and the failure to show respect and care for our returning Vietnam veterans. In the context of the current drawdowns, not only will there be a focus on our returning veterans, we will also need to pay particular attention to recruitment and retention rates, both generally and in specialty areas. The White Paper will address how the ADF adjusts from commitments to distant land-based operations to a focus on the ADF's own force posture, our northern and western approaches, and Australia's backyard, our immediate region and Southeast Asia. The White Paper will also reflect upon the enhancements to a number of Australia's most important overseas relationships as a result of over 10 years of operations in Timor-Leste, Afghanistan, Iraq and the Solomon Islands. The ADF has been engaged in land-based expeditionary operations in Timor-Leste, then Afghanistan, then Iraq and then again in Afghanistan since 1999. Australia has to date tragically suffered 39 casual fatalities in Afghanistan. The last fatality was Corporal Scott Smith in October 2012. Australia has as well seen 251 personnel wounded in Afghanistan since 2001. 33 were wounded last year. Five ADF personnel have been wounded so far this year. On the 26th of March this year, the Prime Minister and I welcomed the decision by the International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, to close multinational base Tarankot in Oroskon province at the end of this year. The closure announcement removed any possible doubt that the timetable to transition to full <coughs> Afghan-led security responsibility for, or for Oroskon would be by the end of this year. The effect of the base closure is that Australia will no longer have a permanent present presence in Oroskon and the majority of ADF personnel will return from Afghanistan to Australia by year's end. Over the past few years, Australia has had approximately 1,550 personnel in Afghanistan. Currently, Australia has about 1,650. That is above the average of, of 1,550 because it includes over 150 personnel whose task is to commence redeployment, repatriation and remediation activities as part of the transition process. There will be some movement in the numbers over this year, and while we are redeploying and repatriating both personnel and equipment, the numbers will go up and down. The overall number of ADF personnel will not substantially decrease until towards the end of this year. However, by year's end, we will see at least 1,000 Australian personnel return home. This process is in accord with the November 2010 Lisbon NATO ISAF summit, where the international community agreed to transition to full Afghan security-led responsibility across the country by the end of 2014. Under this process, 
transition to Afghan security lead in Oriskan commenced in July last year. By November last year, all four infantry Kandaks of the Afghan National Army, the ANA, uh, its 4th Brigade, were operating independently without advisers. With the commencement of independent operations by the four infantry Kandaks, Australian troops no longer conduct joint patrols with these ANA units. As well, Australia handed over control of forward operating bases and patrol bases to the 4th Brigade by the end of last year. <coughs> As a consequence, Australian troops had consolidated their presence at multinational base Tarrant Cot and commenced planning for the complex task of redeploying Australian personnel and equipment and remediation. In recent days, we have seen two significant steps in Australia's transition activity. On the 11th of April, the Australian-led artillery training and advisory team officially completed its mission to establish a fully autonomous Afghan National Army School of Artillery. The school will provide the full range of artillery training courses to the ANA, from recruit training to the disciplines of gun, fire support and fire direction, through to advanced career courses. Since the School of Artillery's establishment in 2010, more than 2,300 trainees have graduated, including 1,100 last year. All Afghan National Army instructors are fully certified and functional equipment status is above 90%. I had the opportunity at Robertson Barracks in Darwin last week to thank members of our artillery units who had helped in training at the school. As well, last week in Darwin, Force Communications Unit 9 conducted its farewell parade prior to deploying to the Middle East area of operations. This communications unit will support ADF force elements throughout the Middle East area of operation, including in Tarrant Cot, Kandahar and Kabul. Generally, the ADF role in Oriskan will continue as at present until the end of this year. Australian troops will continue to train and advise at the headquarters 4th Brigade level with the two combat support Kandaks and at the Afghan Operational Coordination Centre Provincial in Oriskan. The ADF task group will remain combat ready to assist Afghan forces should the need arise and the Special Operations Task Group will continue to conduct partnered combat operations to disrupt the insurgency. In 2014, the ADF will commence a training role at the ANA Officer Academy in Kabul with our British and New Zealand colleagues. In Kandahar, the ADF will continue to provide training assistance to the 205 Corps of the ANA. We are in conversation with NATO, with ISAF, and importantly with the United States and Afghanistan about our role in both 2014 and the post-2014 transition period. It's no secret that, as NATO Secretary-General Rasmussen has himself said, in the first instance we need to get precision from, precision from the United States about what the United States itself sees as the scale of its transition drawdown and its post-2014 transition proposals. What the United States and Afghanistan agree about the United States presence in the post-2014 Afghanistan and what role any United States forces left behind will play is the starting point. Once that is clearer, then Australia and other NATO and ISAF countries will be able to make a judgement about what role, if any, we and they might play. Australia is committed to support Afghanistan through the transition in December 2014 and beyond. Australia demonstrated this commitment to the people of Afghanistan and the international community at the Chicago summit in May 2012 with the signing of the long-term comprehensive partnership between Australia and Afghanistan. The comprehensive long-term partnership demonstrates that Australia is committed to supporting Afghanistan beyond 2014 through cooperation in areas of security, trade and development and building the capacity of Afghanistan's national institutions. Australia is not alone in its long-term commitment to Afghanistan. The United States has also signed a long-term strategic partnership agreement with Afghanistan, as have a number of our ISAF partners, including the United Kingdom, France and Italy, as well as India and NATO itself. Beyond the completion of Afghanistan-wide transition at the end of 2014, Australia is prepared to maintain an ADF presence in Afghanistan in recognition that Australia has a national interest 
in supporting Afghanistan's stability and security after transition. In the post-2014 transition period, Australia is prepared to see the ADF continue to support the development of the Afghan National Security Forces through the provision of training and embedded advisory support, including the ANA Officer Academy in Kabul. Under an appropriate mandate, Australia remains prepared to make a special forces contribution, either for training or for counter-terrorism or for both. Importantly, Australia will contribute $100 million US annually for three years from January 2015 as part of international efforts to sustain and support the Afghan National Security Forces beyond transition. The international community is committed to helping fund the costs of sustaining the ANSF beyond 2014, which is estimated at over $4 billion US dollars per year. In committing to ongoing support, we are mindful of the experience in Afghanistan following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Following the Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan in 1989, Afghan authorities were capable of maintaining levels of security with Soviet financial and material support. However, with the collapse of the Soviet Union and consequent cessation of financial support, government and security in Afghanistan effectively collapsed, leading to insurgency and civil war. Our commitment to Afghan National Security Force funding reflects our enduring interest in, us, in Afghanistan's long-term security and stability. Ongoing funding and assistance for the Afghan National Security Forces is an essential part of maintaining security and stability in Afghanistan. These commitments sent a strong, strong signal to the people of Afghanistan, the Taliban and the region that the international community will not walk away from Afghanistan at the end of 2014. <coughs> Australia must continue to be very clear-sighted about its objective in Afghanistan. Our objective is to prevent Afghanistan from again becoming a safe haven or a breeding ground for international terrorists. An effective Afghan National Security Force and other Afghan institutions will be critical to ensuring this. As transition proceeds, Afghanistan will remain difficult and dangerous. There will be challenges and setbacks ahead, and the Taliban will target the Afghan National Security Forces as it takes responsibility for the security of all of Afghanistan. The IED roadside bomb threat will continue. The Taliban will continue to focus on high-profile propaganda-motivated motiva suicide bomb attacks, together with claiming responsibility for any insider attacks on ISAF forces. And we do need to steel ourselves for the unexpected. Two international community summits, Lisbon and Chicago, have mapped out a sensible and much more orderly drawdown and withdrawal from Afghanistan than Vietnam. But as we discovered post the Chicago summit with insider attacks, successful summits do not of themselves mark the end of transition in practice or reality. They simply lay out the roadmap. Post-transition, security and government influence in Afghanistan will be better and stronger close to population centres. This has always been the case in Afghanistan. Historically, the capacity of government in Afghanistan, either national or provincial, to impose security or effect influence has always been weaker the further one is away from population centres. Our experiences in Afghanistan have been shared with our most important overseas partners. This includes Australia's alliance partner, the United States, traditional partners including the United Kingdom, Canada and New Zealand, and other partners such as Singapore and NATO and NATO member countries. Our international reputation, our credibility and our reliability as a partner as a result of our experience in Afghanistan has been enhanced. Consistent with the finest traditions of Australia and the Australian Defence Force in combat or warlike operations. First class fighters but respectful of international law and highly conscious of the rights of civilians and locals. Australia and the United States will emerge from our commitment in Afghanistan with practical ties closer than ever before, in particular in special forces and the intelligence community. 
Our cooperation in Afghanistan heightened operational tempo over the last 10 years, including maritime operations in the Middle East area of operation, have led to closer defence to defence and military to military engagement with the United States than we have seen since the Vietnam War. This cooperation includes heightened intelligence sharing, special forces engagement with the merging of intelligence and special forces capability, embeds in headquarters for planning purposes and capability, procurement and interoperability. This has been invaluable not just for our reputation, but also for Australian Defence Force professional development of world-class skills. We can and will continue to build on these strengthened ties. One recent example of enhanced practical cooperation between Australia and the United States beyond Afghanistan is the United States Global Force Posture Initiatives. In November 2011, the Prime Minister and President Obama announced during the President's visit to Australia new initiatives that significantly enhance practical defence cooperation between Australia and the US in our part of the world. They of course relate to the rotation of Marines through Darwin, the next uh, 200 or so will arrive in the NT next week, and also enhanced uh, aerial access to our northern uh, Australia RAF bases, in particular Tyndall, and also down the track, uh, enhanced naval access to our Indian Ocean port, uh, HMAS Stirling in Western Australia. Notably, since the deployment of Australian forces in Afghanistan under the NATO-led ISAF mission, Australia's relations with NATO and its member countries and partners have expanded considerably in many areas. In January 2012, Australia deepened its engagement with NATO when it appointed Dr Brendan Nelson as our first ambassador to NATO. Regular high-level political dialogue also underpins cooperation. Australia's defence and foreign ministers regularly attend NATO and ISAF meetings and meet regularly with NATO's Secretary General, who visited Australia last year. Building on the dialogue and cooperation that has been developed, NATO and Australia signalled their commitment to strengthen cooperation in a joint political declaration signed in June 2012 by Prime Minister Gillard and Secretary General Rasmussen. This was followed up by the signing of an individual partnership and cooperation program in February of this year by the Secretary General and I. Our experience over the last 10 years in Afghanistan has also highlighted some important general lessons for the use of military force. First, it has reinforced the well-known point that it is the easiest thing in the world to get involved in major commitments, but it is substantially more difficult to get out. That's why, when a government makes a decision about a military intervention, it must very, very carefully consider whether that intervention is required in a country's national security and national interests. In the case of Afghanistan, there was strong international community and bipartisan domestic support for the intervention in, in Afghanistan, mandated by the United Nations Security Council in December 2001. Progress in Afghanistan was, in my view, substantially undermined as a result of Iraq which was not the subject of a UN mandate and which, and which did not have bipartisan domestic support. My own view is that if there had not been a continually renewed United Nations mandate for Afghanistan, the international community would have withdrawn years ago. One lesson from Vietnam is the need for care and respect for our returning veterans. The care of wounded, injured and ill veterans is a high priority for the government and for the Australian community. In the months and years ahead, veteran care will come to be an increasingly important focus of our time in Afghanistan. As the Prime Minister said in her statement to the House on Afghanistan in October last year, and I quote, the next decade will see more young Australian combat veterans live in our community than since the 1970s. At the time, the Prime Minister said that this would demand changes in the way the Department of Defence and the Department of Veteran Affairs care for service personnel and veterans. I'm pleased to say that these changes are being made. In February, the Minister for Veterans Affairs, Warren Snowden and I, attended the signing by the Secretaries of the Department of Defence and Veterans Affairs of a Memorandum of Understanding on the Cooperative Delivery of Care and Support to Eligible Persons. The MOU is aimed at coordinating the, the delivery of care and support services between Defence and Veterans Affairs. Put simply, it's to stop our wounded, injured or ill veterans from falling between the cracks 
in the system. Private organisations have an important role to play as well. Everyone in Australia will be familiar with the work of the RSL and Legacy, which have been supporting veterans for almost a century. New organisations such as Soldier On and Mates for Mates are now also playing a role, as is the SAS Trust, the Commando Welfare Trust and the Australian Defence Force Assistant Trust. Defence continues to enhance its comprehensive approach to the screening, assessment and treatment of mental health concerns, including post-traumatic stress disorder. ADF members dealing with PTSD have access to the full range of mental health services and rehabilitation services. The ADF is working together with organisations such as Soldier On and Mates for Mates to destigmatise mental health issues. One of the most important factors in treating mental disorders, including post-traumatic stress disorder, is to seek support and treatment as soon as possible. Early identification of those at risk of developing mental health issues is a pathway to better health and personal outcomes. These arrangements result in a high return to work rate for rehabilitated members and provide good support for veterans. But it's essential that we continue to take steps to make the support system even better. Awareness and education in relation to mental health issues is a key factor in preventing future problems. And that is why seeking assistance for mental health concerns was the theme of the inaugural Australian Defence Force Mental Health Day held in October this year. Last year, sorry. Earlier this year, I asked my colleague, Warren Snowden, in conjunction with the CDF and the Secretary, to work with organisations like Soldier On to look closely to see what further comprehensive education and support might be offered across all levels of the ADF and at all stages of an ADF career, from pre-recruitment and recruitment to completion of service. These initiatives will help ensure all members of the ADF are aware of the risks associated with mental health issues, including post-traumatic stress disorder, and know how to address the risk. Let me now make some brief remarks about the 2013 Defence White Paper. The 2013 Defence White Paper will address the range of significant developments internationally and domestically since the 2009 White Paper, uh, which are influencing national security and defence settings. These include the ADF's operational drawdown, which I've referred to, the ongoing strategic shift to our region, the United States rebalance, Australia's own force posture, the, fir the first in a quarter of a century since Professor Dibb's work for Kim Beasley, Jr. And bearing in mind the 2009 White Paper judgment that the global financial crisis was the most fundamental economic challenge facing Australia, the ongoing adverse effects of this crisis, which have continued to have a significant deleterious impact on the global economy and defence funding, seeing what former US Secretary of State for Defence Leon Panetta has called the new fiscal reality. The White Paper will also emphasise, as the Age of Century White Paper did, that the ongoing prosperity of Australia is tied to sustainable security of our diverse region. The White Paper will also identify new opportunities for Australia to pursue deeper strategic and security partnerships in our region following the transition in Afghanistan and the ADF's return from Afghanistan. Our recent forward posture in our immediate area, Timor-Leste and the Solomon Islands, as part of regional stabilisation, will itself change significantly with the drawdown from those two countries. This forward posture and presence in the ADF's second priority task area after the defence of Australia will end after nearly a decade. So in the context of the 2013 White Paper, how does Australia and the ADF adjust and adapt to this? The 2013 Defence White Paper will clearly state that, the, that defence and the ADF's international engagement in our immediate neighbourhood and beyond is both a strategic necessity and an important strategic asset for Australians. My paper details a range of uh, matters that we can pursue in that context. I'll leave those for you to read. Let me conclude as follows. Transition and withdrawal in Afghanistan continues to be a significant strategic challenge facing Australia. How transition, both in Oregon province and Afghanistan ends, will impact on our international reputation and on the risks to Australian citizens from international terrorism. It also poses implications for Australia's strategic environment and posture, for the ADF, 
and for our returning servicemen and servicewomen. This is why we must give very careful consideration to planning for and managing these challenges. We need to avoid the mistakes following on from our last major transition and drawdown, Vietnam, and make the most of the lessons and the benefits we have derived from our time in Afghanistan. Thank you very much for the chance to speak to you today. Can I uh, please ask you to uh, uh, identify uh, yourself, please, when you uh, when you speak, um, and also keep your questions sharp and to the point. No editorial commentaries, please. Um, the floor is open to you. Yes. Thanks very much, Minister. There's one great unanswered riddle, even after your comprehensive speech today. Uh, in uh, May last year, when you and the Prime Minister announced significant budget cuts uh, in defence, uh, the Prime Minister gave uh, an assurance that uh, the formidable array of hardware that defence had been promised in the 2009 White Paper would still be produced, and she actually itemised three warfare destroyers which are being built, the, the two big landing ships, uh, 12 submarines and uh, joint strike fighters. She didn't mention how many. Now, basically, will the Defence White Paper, the 2013 White Paper, or will you today, explain how the limited money available now will cover that comprehensive array of hardware? Well, when uh, the Prime Minister and I made those uh, announcements last year in the context of the run-up to last year's budget, we made it clear that despite the fiscal reality bearing down upon us, uh, and despite uh, the fact that we were in very constrained fiscal circumstances so far as defence and government generally was concerned, we would ring-fence a range of important areas. No adverse impacts for our operations overseas, no ad adverse impact for people preparing to go overseas, no adverse impact on the kit for those people overseas and no reduction in military numbers. We also said that we would ensure that our key and core capability continued and indeed uh, since uh, the budget in last, year, last year's budget, uh, I've announced the acquisition of 10 C-27 tactical uh, airlift. I've also announced what uh, I regard as, in very many respects, the most important acquisition that this government has seen over its uh, five or six years in office to date, the most important uh, uh, acquisition, uh, that of Growler. Uh, I've also made it clear that when it comes to air combat capability, we will not allow a risk to occur to our air combat capability, uh, that risk of course being uh, the delay to the arrival of joint strike fighters, uh, an ageing uh, classic uh, Hornet fleet of 71 uh, and our 24 uh, Super Hornets, uh, 12 of which will now be wired up for Growler. So far as uh, this year's uh, white paper budget and capability uh, plan are concerned, You've been around long enough to know that my formal response to you today will be, if you're interested in these matters, you should turn up at the launch of the White Paper and on Budget Night. Uh, I, would, I would expect nothing less. But I also make uh, this point. If you look at uh, last year's budget, uh, with some additional uh, funds that came in in the course of the end of last year, uh, the budget for last year in one financial year was essentially just under 1.6 per cent of GDP. I make two points about that. Firstly, it's not the only measure, but secondly, if you draw an average or a line over about an eight or nine year period in the early 2000s, from about 2000 on, 2001, 2002 on, you'll see that the average defence expenditure from Australia in GDP terms was 1.7. So those people who have said that uh, last year's budget was the worst day for, for the Australian Defence Force since uh, the fall of Saigon, that people would be planning the invasion from uh, 2028 and that the ADF was in terminal decline is a nonsense. Uh, like every other country, uh, we are under financial constraint as a result of the aftermath of the global financial crisis, but in the White Paper, we will continue to protect our key and core capability and continue to protect in the meantime those other matters that I've referred to. Let's go to another question. Nick Stewart from the Canberra Times. You make quite a point that our withdrawal from Afghanistan will be made on objective measures 
And as a result, as we see the Afghan government and military stepping up, they go where there's quite naturally less of a space for us to be involved. On the other hand, there seems to be this question mark over the SAS. I, I don't understand. If the Afghan army and government are stepping up, what on earth will we need an SAS there for? Uh, why, why will they remain? Surely they are there to, if, if there is a genuine threat for the country. Um, uh, that will be the only reason to maintain them there. Well, we have um, continued the Special, Special Operations Task Group that is continuing its role in the same way that it's played for some time. Uh, doing special forces operations in partnership with uh, with Afghan uh, authorities, uh, both in Oriskan and in surrounding and adjoining provinces, uh, where that has a beneficial impact for Oriskan, and that will continue until the end of 2014. In the meantime, uh, with the closure of Tarrant Cot, with our transition, the question naturally flows: What will be the, the role for our special forces in the year of 2014 and post-transition. Uh, and as I've indicated in my formal paper, we won't be in a position to make judgments about that until we know the detail of the US drawdown and also know what mandate, if any, there will be after 2014 for a special forces presence, either from Australia, the United States or any other country. Uh, and that is why uh, there are two important things that we need to know. One is the detail of the US drawdown, but secondly, and for post-2014 purposes more importantly, what will be the mandate? Currently we have a United Nations mandate which authorises activity by the international community in Afghanistan, including special forces activity. After the end of December 2014, when that mandate ends, for there to be uh, special forces operations, uh, that needs to be done with the approval of the Afghan government. It needs to be done through what we would describe as a special forces, uh, as, as, as a uh, status of forces agreement, what the Afghans would describe as a bilateral, bilateral uh, defence or strategic agreement. So until we know what the potential mandate is, we're not in a position to make a judgment. And we've made it clear that we won't be involved unless there is an appropriate mandate. Having made those two points, in the end it will of course depend upon the wishes of the Afghan government and whether there is a need for us to play a special forces role, either in training or in counter-terrorism -terror operations or both. Uh, and we won't be able to make decisions or announcements about that until that, that seamless flow of decision making occurs. But what is, what is the public policy national interest or national security rationale for the government continuing to say we will play a special forces role if required. What's our mission in Afghanistan? Now, our mission in Afghanistan is to make sure that Afghanistan, particularly the Afghanistan-Pakistan border area, does not again become a breeding, a breeding ground for international terrorism. That's the risk to Australian citizens which we want to close off. To ensure that Afghan institutions, including the Afghan National Security Forces and other institutions, are in a position to meet that challenge, they will require support of the international community after 2014, which I've detailed. Uh, Australia said we'll continue to make uh, training and advice available. We will make a contribution financial, which is, which is uh, very important. And if required, if appropriate, under an appropriate mandate, we would consider a special forces contribution either for training or for counter-terrorism purposes. In the course of uh, the second half of this year, we will come to know the answers to those questions. Perhaps uh, one last question. I think Max... Uh, Thanks. With regard to the drawdown from Afghanistan, what are we going to do with that? Well, as we... It's, 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 it's a very good question. And funnily enough, it's a question that, uh, that we have asked ourselves in our, return, in our internal deliberations. But clearly, as we draw down from Afghanistan, as we draw down from our 1,550 average, we have to look at, uh, as or after that has occurred, what will be our ongoing presence, if any, uh, in the United Arab Emirates in our Al Minhad base. Our Al Minhad, in its present configuration, will of course be absolutely essential until such time as the drawdown and transition by the end of this year occurs. Uh, what we need to do is to make a judgment as those other uh, matters that I've referred to in response to Nick's question, as they unfold, 
uh, what will be the need for a presence, a logistics hub, a presence, support base, an entry point in and out of Afghanistan from Al Minhad. So we'll need to seize these issues. Uh, there's also a separate question, as, uh, which is, do we want to continue to have uh, a presence in the Middle East area of operation, which we've had now for a decade or so? So it's a very good question, and it logically follows from the drawdown in Afghanistan, uh, and, we'll, and that issue itself will fall for consideration towards the end of this year. My expectation is that uh, decisions on that will be made uh, in the course of the first half of uh, 2014. Minister, do you see a continuing naval presence in the Gulf beyond 14? I do. Uh, I've referred in my prepared remarks to the, the maritime presence, which we've had there for a considerable period since uh, one of the very early uh, Gulf, uh, Gulf conflicts. That continues these days not just to play a counter-terrorism role, but also to play a role in piracy and maritime security generally. So I don't see uh, any cessation of that role uh, in the foreseeable future. We've made a good contribution there with a major fleet unit. Uh, that's been good for Navy, good for the ADF, good for Australia's reputation, but it's also a good thing to do as a country which is concerned about maritime security and safety. We're an island country, an island continent, and, and uh, safe uh, and free sea lines of communication are absolutely essential to us for trade and communications and strategic reasons, uh, and I envisage we'll continue to make that uh, contribution for a long time to come. Thank you. Well, uh, Minister, it's, uh, uh, you described quite a, a remarkable confluence of events. Um, the coming to an end of uh, really three major operations which have kept the ADF uh, continuously in operational service almost for a decade and a half, um, and the imminent arrival of a defence white paper and a budget. And I think uh, I can say on behalf of all of us, we thank you for, you, for your time. Uh, we wish you well in your deliberations uh, as you uh, as you finalise those things. Uh, and can I ask you all to uh, please thank Stephen Smith for his time.